Hey folks, Kenny Jang here with Church Butler for yet another installment of our increasingly, I'm happy to say, popular Lunch and Learn series where we sit down across the interwebs. Thank God that Al Gore made it happen. Um, we have our friend Mark McDonald on the other line. Welcome to the show today, Mark. You crack me up. It's you like crack me up, Mark. I'm so glad we actually are able to connect here in Facebook Live and for the podcast. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, so, Mark, where are you in? Where are you today? I love the set that you're on. You must be in Hollywood, California. Tell us a little bit about your environment. Yeah, I'm actually just outside of Winston Salem in a bunker someplace, um, and. Uh, and I I love North Carolina, but I am Canadian, eh? Uh, so I moved here, wow, it's been 17 years ago. And uh, I'm from East Coast Canada. Uh, if you go all the way up Interstate 95 past you yep. and, uh, and keep going up, we're 10 hours north of Boston um, or five hours north of or kind of northeast of Bangor, Maine. So, uh, okay. so um, how long have you been in Carolina? Uh, we've been here 17 years. And um, when I, I was senior creative director for one of Eastern Canada's largest ad agencies. Um, and, and just the whole time that I was working for them, I just kept thinking, why doesn't the church know these principles? And at the time, I mean, it was so long ago. It just, I mean, most churches just pushed back against marketing principles. They, we're not marketing. We're we're just reaching people for Jesus Christ, and and God loved them. I mean, they they were doing a great job, and most churches were in decline. And and what's really crazy, and I know we've talked a little bit before this that we're going to go into rants, but isn't it crazy that here we are? Before the church got marketing principles, they um, they were they were struggling. So now we have all these marketing principles, and here we are. We're all struggling again. It's like you know, eighty to ninety percent of churches are in decline or stagnation. They're not growing. They're not getting it. And uh, okay, so what was your original? Oh yeah, your original question was <laughs> that here I am. I I I decided. You know what? The, the Carolinas is a great place to uh, to find lots of churches and to work with churches. So uh, we moved here 17 years ago, set up an agency working entirely with churches. Um, I, I get to go to a great church here and um, and I get to, to travel all across the country speaking at conferences and talking to pastors. And my heart is with the pastor. Um, some of my best friends are pastors and and I know that what they're doing is incredibly difficult. And and it was a couple of years ago, our church asked me, hey, you you speak everywhere. Like, why don't you why don't you you know do a Bible study or something? So I started a Bible study and and I had that feeling of a church plant. It's like, okay, so I wonder if anyone's gonna come. And then the first day there was just a few people and and um, my wife said, so, so are you going to run this kind of like what you, how you talk to the churches? And, and then of course, somebody in that came the first day was like, well, so what are we going to be known for? And, uh, and I rolled my eyes and I, that afternoon I thought, oh my goodness, I, I, what a great opportunity. So I started kind of talking to people and saying, so what do you want in a Bible study? And they said, you know what? there's just so many complex messages and 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 lots of things being said in church but if you could just give us something that's really simple that's i mean that's all we want so i thought okay i am simple so that would be really easy so i came up with this whole uh thread of simple and practical and and out of that um people started walking through the church and say, Hey, what Bible study do you go to? And they're like, well, I go to this guy, Mark McDonald. And everyone said, who? And they said, yeah, I mean, he's just really just simple and practical. And, and now after a couple of years, it's not even been a, a full two years. Uh, we have 160 people on the roll. Whoa. So I'm not just a person who goes out and consults with churches. 
I run a small church, which um, I know the complexity of every Sunday having to come up with something to say to these people and to try to keep them engaged and to go out and reach the lost in the hallways of our church. Yeah. Well, that's well, fascinating. That, uh, that organic growth, uh, growth. Uh, it means that you have some Christmas there. Yeah. 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 Known for something is a great, great platform that I think you've built over um, the last several, I, I guess, decade, actually. Um, let, now, <laughs> I need to interrupt. Because this is a choose your own adventure interview. The thing, this thing might go south very quickly. Um, you need to disclose your um, affinities and identity. Um, Blue Devil, Tar Heel, or Red State? Oh my goodness! And you know, my uh, one of my best friends is the voice of the Wake Forest Demon Deacons. So, so I, I have to say that I I pay attention to that amount of sports. And I don't follow any other sports. Um, I'm, we you know, and the thing is, I could go off on something, and I seriously, I have never watched a basketball game in North Carolina. What a safe, safe answer, safe answer. Uh, I will disclose, uh, I actually lived down there for seven years, seven and a half you years. You went to Duke, um, right? Uh, being a Blue Devil myself. Um, and so, uh, was in the ad agency down there in a regional, regional shop in good old Durham, North Carolina. Um, so um, as we proceed, uh, we'll proceed lightly because I'm, there might be some um, ulterior motives of that safe answer there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's talk about your book. Uh, you've got a book coming out that quantifies and really captures some of the essence of what you've been developing um, in this area. So why don't you tell us a little bit about it and – where can we get it, Mark, today? Today, oh my goodness. You'll have to come and rob one for me. Um, yes, I have been known for something and it's really, it's, it's entirely, it's about reconnecting with your community by revitalizing your church reputation. And it, it encapsulates, I mean, my it's almost 32 years that I've been doing this and I've taken all 32 years and crammed it into this book. And, and ultimately, I guess, as we've been talking about the whole be known for something concept, we've gotten a lot of, um, you know, attention from various sized churches and, and most people that contact us can't, um, I mean, they just can't afford our process. It's, it's a really, really deep process where we figure out for the church what they should be known for in their reach area. And then how do you develop a brand and communication strategy around it? But for those churches that are smaller, I thought, you know what? They need a book if I could just put it all in writing. So the entire 200 and some pages um, is, is from start to finish of why we do this, how we do it. And then the last part of the book is entirely how should a church effectively set up a communications department? Who should they hire? What are the, the you know, what's the personality types that, that they should be hiring? And then also, how do they make sure that all the ministries in their church actually get along and stop fighting and start, you know, tear down those ministry silos? Because oftentimes the ministries, they... They all have different messaging. They all have different looks. They all have different brands. And what ends up happening is that ministry silos will eventually destroy the church. And instead, what we want to do is we want to create one constant thread that every, every, you know, everyone in the church understands that thread. And that thread corresponds with the people in their community. Every ministry rallies around that thread, and instead of having ministry silos, they actually support the farm. They yeah. they make sure that the church is uh, is pushed first. So, are you talking about being known for something as a, as a, a cause that a ministry should be adopting and be investing in, or is it some other type of notion? Yeah, it's actually a little bit broader than that. And the more broad you can make your thread, the better. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting. Go figure. But we actually based upon what Jesus did. And and when Jesus was meeting with his disciples, he was making disciples and and uh, getting them ready to go out and do something outside of the church walls. And then he himself, it says that he 
left his disciples and went a great distance away and sat down and waited. That means that there was nobody there, but he knew at the well that there were going to be people coming along with some needs and concerns. And sure enough, this woman, this poor woman who has no name, um, walks up and he instantly knows if you're here, you have a need and that's water and you're thirsty. And he knew that just like every church should know in their community, what are the temporal needs of the community so that like Jesus, Jesus immediately looked at her and started to engage with her about water. And, and instantly he had a connection with her because water. Yeah, that's why I'm here. I'm, I'm going to, and there was a conversation that happened, but, where I think a lot of churches stop short who like that that idea and that concept is that Jesus knew how to make the turn from the temporal need and he makes the turn to the eternal need. And yeah. and he, you know, what, what if I could give you water that where you would never thirst again? Somebody who's looking for water because they're thirsty and you're going to give me something that satiates me for the rest of my life? and eternity uh yes well the thing is is that the church needs to make sure that they can make the turn so whatever their thread is the thing that the big concept of what they want to be known for they it should be more on a temporal level not on a religious level but that thread has to quickly tie itself to the scarlet thread of, of christ's blood that that's drizzled throughout all of scripture yeah, so um, this this is a I, I love your posture on this, and uh, I love also a recent um, blog post that you put up at beknownforsomething.com, talking about is your church known by love this way? And one of the practical tools that you suggested, which uh, we actually did in my uh, past church, was the five love languages by Gary Chapman. Um, and I will tell you that when I've mentioned that book to other ministry leaders. Um, they've actually kind of <laughs> looked a little quirky saying, well, how do you use that? Or what would what would you do with that? Can you talk to us a little bit about why that's such a relevant book or conversation piece for ministry itself? Oh, my goodness. Thank you. It is like you just lobbed this ball up in the air. <laughs> uh, well, I, but the thing is, I think it is a conundrum. Some people just don't get they don't see how it fits or why it would be relevant. Well, first of all, as you can see, I don't know whether you can see, but Gary Chapman wrote the foreword to my book, and he's the the author of the five love languages. Gary and Carolyn are are dear friends of my wife and I, and uh, I mean, what an an incredibly simple premise to his book of the five love languages, and and ultimately, we oftentimes waste our our love thinking someone's going to receive it in a different way than we give it. And we think we're loving somebody, but to them receiving that doesn't mean love at all. And what we need to do is we need to make sure everything, everything has to rise and fall on who you're communicating with. Uh, everything has to rise and fall on how they're receiving it, not about how I'm giving it. And, and oftentimes the church goes, yeah, but we're just loving our community. But the problem is, is that the community isn't feeling the love. And, yes. and, and in, to be put in a little bit cruder terms, you're all wasting your money. Yeah. Like you're, you're wasting all of the effort. And so what we do is our, our whole process and what I would encourage every church to do is Stop thinking what you do best, but start thinking what they want. And and then, you know, there's an intersection of, of circles. It's like that Venn diagram. You have, you know, what what your audience is looking for and what you're able to deliver. And where the intersection happens, that's where true engagement happens. And And the scary thing is with the church today, this intersection that's happening is barely happening. And, and we want to try to move those circles together so that we actually have a large intersection. And what I would encourage every church to do, similar to the five love language book, if I'm loving my wife in 
a way that I like and she's not receiving it as love, maybe I shouldn't love her that way. Why wouldn't I love her the way that she wants to feel loved? And in, in, in that same sense, the church needs to start looking at some of its programs and they need to start killing some of those programs because it's a waste of time, it's a waste of money, and they're probably struggling in numbers anyway, so now's the time. Sorry, that was a rant again. It's I love it. And, you know, one of the things that communicators do struggle in this area is how do you translate the, to the actual practice of social media management, right? If you if church comm people are going to be watching this interview today and they're going to be saying, yeah, I get that. I understand it. You know, I can buy into that. But what does that mean for the content that I'm supposed to be posting to Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and Snapchat? How do I actually, um, you know, translate that to, to, to show that we are trying to be all about our audience and not about us? And um, another, again, I, I love your blog, by the way. If people here haven't visited the site, it's be known for something .com, right, Mark? That's correct. And um, and there's another post that I think struck me, and which is people don't talk about this, right? The church asked them, they didn't answer, right? Where you're trying to collect stories from the communities. You want to do it, um, you know, effectively. And you post on your social media pages requesting, you, know, you want questions answered for, say, an upcoming sermon series. Or do you have some type of biblical question that you've always wanted the church to answer? Right? It seems like a great idea. Um, but then things don't happen. So can you guide us through even just let's maybe we can use the next couple of minutes here in our interview today to be hyper practical, tactical. You know, how do you translate that into what you literally are posting on social and engaging with people so that people do respond and people do see what you're trying to get across in terms of being known for love and focus on them? Well, it's interesting because, I mean, what a multifaceted question. And yes, over the next four hours, Kenny and I will talk about the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I've met some people who run social media and I didn't enjoy talking to them. A lot of people. I think that's who, the tweet of the day right there. <laughs> a lot of people who run what social media. names, Mark? What are they names? <laughs> no, but a lot of people who run social media for their church can't carry a conversation. And so they wonder why their social media is not working. It's because they can't carry a conversation in, in reality. Yeah. And, and oftentimes, I think that people miss that connection that they have to have with people. So instead, it's like, okay, this is the first time that we've actually talked. We, and I, I just want to go off and start talking about a bunch of things because I think that we have a lot of connection. But the, the problem is, is that if you can't connect with people, and I am an inter, I'm more of an introvert than I probably come across, but if you can't connect like genuinely with people, then you can't connect on social media. Because all of a sudden, social media just becomes an, an, a yelling platform. It's like yeah. this advertisement platform where someone goes, well, I put it out on social media. It's like, really, did you have any comments? No. Should we? Um, yes, because social media should be a conversation. It, and, and churches had picked up on this and, and said, oh my goodness, we wouldn't have to have bulletins, which all should be killed, but the but we don't have to have bulletins because we have social media now, we have websites now. And and the problem is, is that we've just become an advertising yelling mechanism where yeah. we're just yelling at everybody and, and they're not responding. So if people aren't responding, if if my kids say, I went into the group and I tried to talk to them and no one wanted to talk to me, well, then you need to try a different approach. And and a lot of times churches, you know, it's, wow, it hurts when I do this. And you go, well, stop doing that then. If they're not getting the engagement from the, the community, they're not receiving it in the way that you think that they that you gave it. So it's similar to the five love language. I mean, it comes around full circle that 
obviously they want something different and and social media is an entertainment device it is not a a a advertising device and and in the same way that we tune in it's like hey so what'd you watch on tv last night well i tuned into an hour of of commercials said no one ever except for the super bowl maybe but uh but ultimately we're tuning in for the entertainment so what what should the church do we need to start entertaining better oh we're, we're a church we don't want to entertain okay during your service i'll give that to you but throughout life you've got to start entertaining and and engaging with people in the way that they find entertainment so so like a good television show which is about 80 percent content and and 20 percent advertisements then set up your social media so that for 80 percent of the time you're it's just pure entertainment it's just engagement wow i love when they pop up my feed wow i love what they they just made me think about wow i i had never heard that song before like whatever it is find out who your community is on social media and entertain them yes and then, yes and then what you want to do is that and I say 20%, but even less than 20% throw in an ad every so often. And people go, whoa, that's good. That I, I, I'm engaged with this church and, and they have that. I never expected that for a church. Yeah, I'll come to, I'll come to that. So how do you, how do you set up your entertainment? Do you just go out into YouTube and find a thing to, to and that's what drives me crazy too i could go off on a rant like that oh isn't this funny oh isn't this good and the thing is is that there is all this random crap can i say crap on your show <laughs> <laughs> all this random crap that people are putting out and there's nothing that would tie it together to a thread yes and it's like if you wanted to say you've looked in your community and you found oh my goodness like way high levels of divorce people are struggling with marriages people like so you know your community is is in a in a bad situation with divorce well maybe your church's thread can become how do you talk better to your spouse or how do you how do you create healthier marriages or or something of, around that thread, some, some very broad thread. You create a tagline that, that is associated with your church all the time. Your brand starts to be associated with that benefit. And then somebody in the community might say, I don't want church. Oh, but you'll give me five ways that I can talk to my spouse this right. weekend to, to solve marriage problems. Uh, yes, where do I download that? So then when it comes to the entertainment value on your social media, look through YouTube, look through memes, look through all the things that are out there that are really good entertainment, but choose the ones that only help relationships, help healthy marriages, help conversation. Love it, love it, love it. Yeah, one of the things that I go through with some of my coaching clients is that you have to have a felt needs assessment and a map for the audience that you're trying to reach and prioritize that, right? It's Absolutely. not about you. Put down the megaphone, pick up the telephone. Let's have a conversation and let's actually be something interesting and be known for something. And I love what you're pushing in the posture. Again, it's a, it's a posture, right? Even the five love languages. Um, I haven't read the word, uh, the book recently, but it's uh, words of affirmation. It's spending time with each other, right? It's some people like receiving gifts. Some people physical like physical touch. touch. Some people like uh, acts of service, right? Acts of service. Physical so touch. It, it is the... I think it's the acts of service, right? Being able to empathize and then finding the resources, doing the heavy lifting of the work, and then showing up in the quality time aspect of providing those resources and being willing to talk or be willing to use that platform as a forum for that affinity group, right? That's one of that's that's an easy way. But also, I mean, they will know we're Christians by our love, yes. Who, you know, everyone always says, so what should we be known for? Well, ultimately, we should be known for love. But that love gets shown in a different way. And in the same sense, if you have a thread, what's really good as a social media person, because you're constantly looking for other types of content, 
know that everyone feels love and receives love differently. So if your thread is about relationships, have the five love languages right there and say, have I shown love about relationships right. that way? Have I shown it that way? And make sure that all the five love languages are are shown through everything that you're doing in communications. Yeah, yeah, I love it, love it. So um, what else? Let's talk a little bit more about social because I think what you're getting at is um, you know, something that's critical on what's missing. Like what my rant is that we both are in several Facebook groups, for instance, with tons of communicators and it's the 80, 20, 90, 10 rule. There's tons of lurkers out there. There's, no, there's only a handful that actually take the time to engage in, in those forums, even amongst us as communicators. And that's supposed to be our tip of the sword, right? Even if you're an introvert or extrovert, uh, why aren't the communicators themselves engaging in the forms that are supposed to help and, and serve our own community. And yet at the same time, they complain about their own community in their church not engaging, right? So that's one of my rants. But I do feel like, do you, do you feel that there needs to be some pastoral training even, some type of resources to that degree, um, practical theology for communicators? Because not everyone is in the role of the communicator that has a pastor background necessarily. Yeah, and how important it is that every person who works in the church needs to be in the Word. Because oftentimes what I see is that um, people who work in the church, it's almost like they feel like they're exempt from having to, to do anything in theology because I work in a church. And, and how important it is to make sure in order for you to actually be interested in sermons and in the series that's going on, do the heavy lifting to try to figure out how can I support my pastor more so you can feed some stuff in there or maybe he can follow your social media and go, whoa, that's a really great uh, illustration or something that I could use in my sermon or, or maybe you engage your audience to audience where Somebody responds to you and has a great story and says, you know what, I, I rarely ever comment on anything, but you really spoke to my heart here, and this is what happened to me this past week. And then the pastor can put you on side of social media and say, I'd love to talk to you further about that, and maybe a video can be done from it, and it can kind of blow up into a sermon. But you know, you know, Yep. Oftentimes, Oftentimes, the times first communicator, communicator um, uh, just decides, decides all I am all is just am a, service is person. a service person. And they need to, they actively, need to engage actively engage and make sure that they sure understand, they understand the, the topic. The topic that the church the is a chat to on this, but, but also whatever sermon series is going on. on. So that they can engage at a engage totally at different level different and maybe level. even more and human level than the pastor can on Sunday mornings. Yeah, definitely. So um, you've put out this book. I'm sure you're, uh, this is you're going to go through a launch phase and tour and talk even more about this. Uh, what's on the horizon after that? Once someone catches this idea of being known for something they develop in their ministry, is there something else? That's, what's the next? Uh, what's the next book actually? Though, right? Well, to go deeper, to become a ninja at this, what what should someone be paying attention to? What are you paying attention to these days? Well, you know, it's interesting because there's so much that um, in the branding world, you know, I, we, we talk here about putting on your, your thread glasses. So once somebody has captured what their thread is, it's kind of like that first time like you buy a, buy a Toyota and then then it's like, oh my goodness, I'll be the first one to have this Toyota. And then you you're, you get into it and you drive down the street and it's like, everyone's driving the same car as me because you don't you don't realize it until your eyes are open to it. And, and oftentimes, once you know who your brand is, the be known for something or your colors, you know, the, the blue that we always have through all of our colors, I see those things all the time. Every time I look around, it's like, oh, there's something. And that oh, that connects to our thread. And, and this works. And every church, once you know what their thread is, they'll be shocked and amazed at how much entertainment is out there that they can pull and 
you start seeing, and I would, I would, I'm not really sure what the next book's going to be. It'll either be something along that line or, um, and here we're, I know we're getting near the end of all of this, but, uh, I'll throw this little nugget out, but I'm a, I'm a national commercial model. I, I have a, a, a <laughs> Volkswagen commercial out right now, uh, two men in a truck. So I, I get to, to do modeling and acting on the side. And, and I'm thinking maybe the next books might be called the model church communicator. What does it mean to be on show as a, as a church communicator and be more active rather than this passive non-leader person who tries to have conversations but but isn't really doing it properly that's an interesting take i, I think i would love to see that teased out more that, that actually is an interesting thread and i want to see more modeling of you as the happy driver of uh, more cars out there <laughs> uh just for our audience if they haven't seen the uh video of you and your fake wife in the front seat <laughs> uh, where can they find that? Is that on YouTube or is that on your site anywhere? Yeah, if you go to Volkswagen uh, YouTube site, um, I'm I think there's a there's a series of them. Plus, if you follow Volkswagen on their uh, Instagram and social media platforms, uh, they're going to be taking. We shop for an entire day in Charleston, and they, I mean, they they have a lot of footage, and there was different demographics. I was the old guy. So it's like they have a whole bunch of young people as well, but they're taking all of those little snippets and they're being really creative with their social media. So there's a lot to be, uh, to be learned for, for that. Maybe it's just getting a group of people together from your church on a, on a Saturday and just shoot lots and lots of footage and then just pull and do excerpts and try to figure out. So how can we communicate our thread this way? And how can we communicate it this way? And, and maybe, even uh, get each of your different pastors of your different ministries to be in charge of finding models. And I would strongly urge you, people don't choose me because of what I look like other than that I look like their, their customers. So, so we need to stop just showing random pictures on our websites and in our social media. We need to show pictures of people who look like your community if you want to reach your community. Because if you don't want to reach your community and you just want to reach the people who come to your church, your congregation, we might as well just start planning your funeral because you will go under really fast. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I That's, again, this must be the rant o -rama show because <laughs> uh, I... Recently, I was with a communicator who said, look, I'm, uh, these stock photography sites are really expensive. You're telling me that they're too glossy, that you sh I shouldn't be using them. What? I have no n nothing to use. And I said, you know what? With all the money you're spending on online resources, go find a local photographer on Craigslist, right? Um, everybody with a DSLR is a wedding photographer today, right? So find somebody, pay them $200, $300 a day max so you can find somebody – to come do a, either a day or two, maybe one day in the week and one day on Sunday, and just have all these different use cases where you have a shot list, and then you've got stock for a year that you can pull from, right? I mean, that's just yeah. an easy, easy way to do it. And the only exception to that is that if you happen to see a picture of me on stock, which you might, uh, just go ahead and buy that one, but don't buy anyone else. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Be known for something. Be known. The model, the man, the myth. <laughs> so um, as we close out today's interview, where can we get another dose of your humor, your good looks, your um, pastoral abilities? Uh, can you share with us some of your digits, as we like to say, tell us where to send the carrier pigeon? Is it on Twitter, snail mail? How do we get in touch with you? Yeah, you can find me almost everywhere on on all. The, I mean, Pinterest, Instagram, uh, Twitter, all under Mark Mac ten twenty three. On Facebook now, there is author Mark McDonald that uh, that you can find me at. Um, also, if you just go to beknownbook dot com, uh, it'll it'll take you to our website right now, but. <laughs> Hopefully in the next week or so, as all the pre-launch stuff goes up and um, and the book becomes available, 
I think by Monday, we should probably have that on Amazon so that uh, the publisher and I are actually talking right after this. So, but I think it's Monday where the pre-orders start. Um, but by all means, and if you tweet me or if you talk to me, I will talk back. I, I care about every person who picks up their fingers and starts typing towards me. Yeah, that's almost like the challenge in Micah that says, test me, test me, test me, reach out to me. Uh, Mark McDonald, 1023. Um, we would love oh, to Mark have the conversation Mac. on Twitter. Oh, Mark, Mark Mac. Yes, it's on the Mark screen. Mac, right. Yes, Mark Mac, 1023. Nice. The only on LinkedIn, it's Mark McDonald, 1023. That's the only one. Yes, we got it right in the lower thirds here. Um, but. Um, yes, I, that's one of the things I appreciate about you is that your accessibility, you're obviously easy to talk to uh, for some people, easy on the eyes. And so we will um, stop this conversation here today, but I need you to promise to come back on after the book is launched um, so we can talk about even books, publishing, because I think that's another great tool that ministries out there are missing out on publishing is, some, is a powerful powerful thing that changes the dynamics of authority and trust in a, a personal platform as well as um, institutional organizations of, of leaders in them so well and as to come back we love it absolutely but as a transition to that um you know a pastor might not want to write a book or one of the church communicators that's out there doesn't want to write a book or you're thinking, man, I just want to write a book. Well, start with a blog. Try to figure out who your audience is. Build your platform on the blog. Plus, your pastor should all have something on your website for a blog. The average person spends, you know, three seconds on a home page, 10 seconds on an inside page of your website, but they'll spend up to a minute on a blog page. So, so I mean, you get six times the, the amount of uh, attention on a blog. So, so do that and make it a transition into it. Into it. Yeah. So and your so I guess your your position is blogging is not dead. Blogging is not dead as long as it's written properly. Nice. Okay. So, um, folks, uh, would love for you to thumb up this broadcast and this video. Leave some comments below. We'd love for you to let us know. We want to respond to your needs um, for, for some of the topics. Is it publishing? Is it blogging? What is it? What are the things that we can call Mark and say, hey, the people of the interwebs need to know and get them back on here for our next Lunch and Learn. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much. Um, take care, and we'll catch you next time here on the Church Butler Lunch and Learn.